one of the grandest buildings in history. And the biggest temple complex of the classical era is the Temple of Jerusalem, which was restored by Herod the Great and stood during the time of Jesus. He who has not seen the Temple of Herod has never seen a beautiful building in his life. According to the Talmud, Jesus frequently visited and taught inside the temple because he liked it. Only the ruins of this once magnificent building remain after the Romans destroyed the temple in 70 AD. On what is now known as Tisha B'Av, Jews worldwide commemorate the destruction of the temple every year in the late summer. Numerous artists have tried to reproduce the temple through sculpture, artwork, and 3D modeling over the ages. None of these models have yet to fully depict the temple in all of its grandeur and splendor. Despite the fact that these earlier attempts have given a solid notion for the overall design, our team has been working on the most accurate and detailed 3D model of Herod's temple for more than two years, putting in hundreds of hours. Our model is based on the most recent archaeological research and findings in addition to ancient historical sources. This is the first of several movies that will help you better comprehend this hallowed building, including what might have happened within, how it would have looked, and why Jesus was so protective of it, even referring to it as his own house. We will discuss some of the design and research components we used to make this model of Herod's temple in the first video, along with why these particulars make the model unique. Herod was a skilled constructor. He was dubbed Herod the Great for his numerous spectacular palaces and other construction endeavors. He had a strong interest in classical architecture, as evidenced by the numerous archaeological remnants of his buildings. The Greeks and Romans were among the ancient peoples who came to value aesthetics based on a geometric proportioning method. The symmetry of the human body and natural proportions like those of flowers, or seashells, were mimicked to create what is now known as the appropriate application. Of what are known as the architectural orders is one of the fundamental tenets of classical design. A column, capital, and entablature are all used together in an order. Herod used the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian architectural orders as his primary styles. A sophisticated set of laws based on proportions and ratios regulate every facet of these three orders. For instance, the height of the column, the size of the capital, and every other feature of the entablature are all determined by the width of the column base. This can be quite useful since we can use these ratios to recreate the rest of the structure. Even if we only have one component of the order from an excavation, the column and other elements will feel either excessively wide and bulky or too tall and flimsy. If the proper proportions are not employed for these orders, these proportions were honed by the ancients until they believed they had found the ideal balance between making the edifice appear grandiose and graceful. Of the three orders, the Doric is the most basic. By increasing the shaft's width by eight, the column's height was calculated. Doric columns felt more expansive, fundamental, and manly, because they were the shortest of the three major orders. This arrangement was utilized in the less significant portions of a building, such the outermost porches of the temple. With its exquisite volutes that embellish the column capital, the Ionic order was perceived as being more delicate and feminine. Its height was nine times the column base's breadth. A number of extremely well-preserved capitals from Herodian Jerusalem excavations served as the model for our Ionic capitals. Of the three primary orders, the Corinthian order is the most elaborate and graceful. Its height was calculated by increasing its diameter by ten which made it robust but slender. The more significant components of a construction were typically assigned this order. A number of partially intact Herodian capitals and broken pieces from the temple complex served as the inspiration for our design for the Corinthian capitals. The columns for each of these three orders were tapered toward the top, swollen in the lower third of the shaft, and broader at the base. This gave the appearance that it was taller and more durable than it actually was. Additionally, it seemed as though the column was flexing as it stood tall, giving the impression that the shaft was supporting the weight of the ceiling more securely. Another crucial element of classical design is the appropriate column spacing. The distance that a stone entablature could span before breaking was determined by the ancients to be three times the breadth of the column. The structure would collapse if the span was wider than this because the stone would shatter. 
the approach began with the application of these classical design concepts. Next, we examined over 500 stone fragments that belonged to the temple and were catalogued by Dr. Orit Peleg. The many capitals, entablatures, and other stone elements were subsequently embellished with these details. These 500 stones and other historical archaeological artifacts are the source of every feature we used in our 3D model. We were able to rebuild the original walls of Herod's temple with a high degree of accuracy because a significant portion of the temple's foundations are still intact. Every stone that is known to have been a part of the old temple mount has been catalogued by Dr. Eilat Mazar and her colleagues. Our 3D model's walls were based on their painstaking designs. Our crew included the stone in the model if it is still standing today. The majority of stones are roughly 1.1 meters tall, with a drawn margin around the edge for ornamental purposes. As the wall rises from the ground, it slants steadily inwards because each stone course is set back by roughly 2.5 centimeters or 1 inch. In addition to providing stability and a broad, sturdy base, this gives the impression that the building is more substantial and stable. It will appear to bend outward, nearly toppling over, while you are standing beneath a wall that rises straight up. The building feels more structurally sound with this small tilt. Herod constructed enormous rows of alternating cornerstones to support the substantial foundation walls. One of these cornerstones, known as headers and stretchers, was thought to weigh 80 tons and measured up to 12 meters in length. This foundation has been in place for almost two millennia. Our team adhered to classical design standards for all temple doorways, creating doors with a 1x2 ratio. Here, you can see how an excessively tall or short doorway can appear out of scale and less attractive and friendly. The double gate, the best preserved gate still standing on the southern wall, served as the model for the temple mount's outer gates. The ancient doorpost and a portion of the enormous lintel and archway are still visible, although being partially obscured by a building today. In order to evenly distribute the weight over the entryway and prevent the lintel from breaking under pressure, Herod frequently chose archways over lintels for gates. Additionally, a number of Temple Mount ornamental stone door frames have been unearthed. One of these stones may have fallen from the entryway that was situated atop the enormous staircase because it was discovered beneath what is known as Robinson's Arch. At the Triple Gate's entry is another stone that remains in situ, possibly in its original location. Scholars continue to argue whether the Triple Gate was originally a double gate or a triple gate, and the remainder of the gate is not original. The stone on the left tells us how the rest of the doorway would have appeared and is still in its original location. Only a handful of the original Temple Mount platform's paving stones are left. Therefore, we used a section of stone pavement that had been excavated just below Robinson's arch as a reference to recreate the flooring. Despite significant erosion, the size and overall pattern of the laid stones are still present in this portion. An additional feature of this road is a stone drain, which we utilized in the temple's various areas, including the priest's court, to remove the blood from the sacrifices. Some of the flooring were laid with stones of all sorts, according to Josephus a Jewish historian, who lived in Jerusalem, Jewish War 5, 192. This probably alludes to the ornate and beautiful opus sectal floors that were common at the time. An unlawful excavation along the southeast portion of the Temple Mount was carried out in 1999 by the Muslim authorities in charge of it. In the Kidron Valley, about 9,000 tons of earth were deposited. About 100 pieces of opus sectile floor tiles that were once part of the temple were among the thousands of relics that were sifted from the dirt. Mathematician and volunteer Frankie Snyder observed that several of the angles on the stones were specific to Herod's buildings. She came up with several designs after studying previous Herodian mansions with opus sectile floors. The flooring of some of the temple's numerous porticos was recreated with the help of this research. To recreate what must have been an absolutely breathtaking view, we even mimicked the hues and reflecting qualities of the stones. Remarkably, there is still a single temple ceiling beneath the Temple Mount platform today. The Roman demolition never completely damaged the ceiling on the southern wall of the double gate. Through the foundation, this gate led to the temple platform. From its ceiling, a number of beautiful domes remains, 
Based on Dr. Lean Rittmeyer's research, our team meticulously reconstructed these vaults and domes. The sole surviving stone column from Herod's temple, which is likewise mirrored in our design, supports the domes. Rittmeyer claims that these spectacular domes may have been known as the Beautiful Gate, where, following the day of Pentecost, Peter healed a lame man. The ceilings of the royal stoa, one of the temple's most ornate,